Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, depending on where you are, good morning, uh, good evening. Uh, thank you to everyone who's been able to join. Uh, it's five minutes past uh, the schedule time. Uh, you can hear the beeps going on. Uh, doubt there will be more people uh, joining us as they are ready. Uh, but um, it's important that we start. Uh, let me introduce myself. Uh, Biniam is my name. Uh, I am the Deputy Dean uh, for Postgraduate and Research uh, at uh, the University of the Western Cape uh, at the Faculty of Law. I am based at the Della Omar Institute and I, I, I head the Children's Rights Project there. And today, of course, uh, we are having a memorial lecture, uh, the Ivan Rujema uh, Memorial Lecture. Uh, we do have uh, a memorial lecture at the law faculty, uh, the one that is particularly based uh, at the Della Omar Institute, uh, which is the which is to commemorate uh, the life uh, and achievements and ideals that uh, Della Omar had. Uh, for those of you who might not know, uh, Della Omar was the first minister of uh, justice of democratic South Africa. Uh, he was President Mandela's lawyer. Uh, I have never met him. I have never had the privilege to meet him. He was an anti-apartheid stalwart. Uh, and having heard from his family members, from people who worked with him, uh, I know for a fact that he was a larger than life person. Uh, he was someone who actually embodied uh, the spirit of Ubuntu uh, and much more. Uh, I had a bit of a conversation with someone the other day asking, uh, the person said she taught memorial lectures was just only for people uh, who were at a ministerial level or who were higher uh, in terms of rank uh, and so forth. And I said, no, absolutely not. Uh, we definitely do memorial lectures for famous people, for people who've been in power and so forth. Uh, but we also do uh, honor colleagues. Uh, there are a couple of memorial lectures for academics, uh, for people who have never been ministers or have never worked for government. And in any case, as I often like uh, to say, uh, Ivan was uh, Aninyanga Mugayo, as they say in Kenya, Rwanda. Uh, Aninyanga Mugayo is, I'm told, a person who stands against shame, uh, who refuses public blaming, who's honest, reliable, impartial, uh, and acts as vanguards of trustworthiness uh, in their communities. In fact, uh, in the legal system uh, in Rwanda, uh, these persons of trust are elected to mediate parties uh, in media mandatory mediation uh, at the lower level of the Rwandan legal system. Uh, so the colleague that we're actually honoring today, uh, he's not just a colleague, he's actually a classmate, uh, he's a friend, he's a mentor, uh, he's a teacher, uh, and of course, he's a son, he's a sibling, uh, a cousin, a brother-in-law and a family member for many. And not just in our nuclear understanding of uh, family, uh, but in the broader uh, context of uh, what family means, particularly within, within the African continent. When we were preparing this event, quite a lot of the conversation happened over WhatsApp. And what was fascinating to me was that Nobody said to me, whosoever we contacted to be on the program, to identify the date, uh, to identify the topic, or anything, whatever the case may be, uh, nobody came back uh, to me and said, uh, I will get back to you, or let me check my schedule, uh, or let me think about it. Nobody said that. There was a lot of goodwill. There was a lot of cooperation. There was a lot of positive gesture that was extended, not necessarily because it's from UWC, not necessarily because myself or some of the family members were pushing towards this, but not necessarily because of the topic, predominantly because of Ivan, uh, because Ivan would have said yes. He was very generous with his time in more ways than one. When Ivan died, there was a memorial that was held uh, at the faculty. Uh, Professor Bob Martin was the dean at the time. Uh, I unfortunately did not get the opportunity to attend uh, that event. Uh, I was uh, out of the country, but that was a memorial service. But what we're doing today is a memorial lecture. We want to honor and celebrate Ivan's life, the things that he stood for, and the things that he appreciated in more ways than one. Uh, and of course, the manner in which uh, he, he, he embraced Ubuntu, the manner in which he embraced humanity. That's what we're here to do. Now, I was looking at the program for today's event. And of course, I also had the opportunity to look at the people that have registered for this event. We have more than 200 people that have registered for the event. Uh, and as I was going through the list, uh, I could easily see they, there are people that are actually attending this event who have spent much more time with Ivan, who knew Ivan much more than I do. 
uh, and to a certain extent, much more than some of the people that we have uh, rightly identified uh, to be speakers uh, during this event. Uh, I do hope, I can even say I do expect that this is the first memorial lecture. Uh, I expect that we will have others uh, in the future. Uh, and of course, when we have some of those in the future, uh, I look forward to uh, incorporating those friends uh, and, and people who have known Ivan much closer uh, to be part and parcel of not just only the participation, but also to be part and parcel of the program. Now, let me come to the ground rules, and I will hand over the floor to our colleague, uh, Professor Jacques Deville. The ground rules are the following. Uh, we want you to keep your microphone on mute. We want you to keep your camera off, unless and otherwise you are a speaker. That would be very much appreciated. Put your comments in the chat and any questions that you might have from the public lecture that we will have uh, shortly, uh, you can also put those questions uh, in the chat. There is a hashtag that has been created for this event, uh, Ivan Rijuema Memorial Lecture. So if you tweet, please do tweet, uh, use that hashtag uh, for the event. The event is being recorded. Uh, in fact, once we put online uh, about this event, I have received a number of inquiries about the event, some people writing from the US and saying uh, we, it will be a different time for, because of the time difference, we will not be able to join, uh, or from uh, elsewhere saying uh, because of XYZ reasons, we would love to attend, but we are not able to attend. So we will make sure that this is recorded, it's being recorded, uh, and we will make it available uh, on our YouTube uh, Having said that, uh, I am going to uh, give the floor uh, to Professor Jacques Deville. Uh, once Professor Jacques Deville uh, makes the welcome remarks, uh, I will briefly take you through uh, the remaining part of the program uh, and we will uh, continue. Uh, Professor Deville, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Benya. Um, I was asked to, to say a few words of, uh, of welcome uh, this evening. Um, and so I want to start by uh, recognizing Professor Lavac, our DVC academic, who will say a few words of thanks towards the end. Um, our former colleague, uh, Sam Rujeja, I haven't seen his name yet, um, but um, uh, he has hopefully also, also uh, joined us. Then to the family and friends of the late Ivan Rujema, um, to our colleagues and uh, everybody else who, who joined us today. So as Benyam said, this is the first Ivan Rajema Memorial Lecture and we hope that there will be more in future. It's a sad but also at the same time a joyous occasion for us. It's a real privilege for us to, to welcome back, even if only virtually, Sam Rajeje, um, former Chief Justice of Rwanda, uh, professor at UWC, our former colleague, um, you will have seen in the invitation his many achievements. Um, I will not repeat them now, but we, of course, are very proud of these achievements since he left UWC, and we also tend to claim some credit for it, even though it may be undeserved. We remember Sam as a wonderfully kind and also a humble colleague. Uh, he was with us from 1997 to 2004. As Benjamin also said, we are this afternoon um, or this morning for some of us uh, honoring and celebrating the life of our former colleague Ivan Kairu Rujema. I remember him as a brilliant student during his LLB studies, and as you all know, he completed his studies summa cum laude. Thereafter, he completed an LLM degree in international trade and investment law at UWC and also an LLM in dispute resolution, which is our theme today at the University of Missouri. Now this he did on a scholarship, uh, which is made possible to a very great extent by Rod Apoff, who is also with us uh, today. Um, and he studied at the University of Missouri. And this scholarship is now named after Ivan Rujema, who was one of the first recipients. I will end this brief welcome with the words of Ivan himself, as expressed in the acknowledgments of his LLM thesis, which he did at UWC in November 2008, which shows his humility, his love and gratitude to his family and friends, as well as his love for UWC and the UWC staff. He starts by thanking God, and then he says, and I quote, 
Daddy and Mummy. Words cannot express the gratitude I feel for everything you do for me. You let me, you led my first steps to school and have encouraged and supported me in all my endeavors since. Thank you for the many times you have ensured that I have everything I need to achieve, all that I have been able to. To be sangire tuese, which if I understand it right means we are a community we share, we share in our goals. To my siblings, thank you all. His siblings, Joshua, Moses, Faith, Michelle. He says specifically, a special thanks to Moses for always responding to my smoke signals and Michelle for constantly updating me on what is going on at home, which believe it or not, gave me peace of mind to concentrate on my work. To my supervisor, Professor Ricky Vandrach, Thank you for having been willing to take me on halfway through my work. We have all seen your desk, but you were always there to answer my sometimes vague questions and to provide me with the guidance I needed to produce good results. My thanks do not extend only to this work, but to your mentorship even during my LOB years. To my good friends, Richard Karu Karama, I believe he is now a senior lecturer at the University of Rwanda, and Yvonne Wambui, thank you. Rico, Richo, thank you for continually being my guinea pig. Since 2003, you have gone before me, showing me what the road ahead requires, which has made my path much easier. Yvonne, thank you for the encouragement and companionship and for always reminding me to strive for more. Lastly, but by no means least, thank you, Professor Lehman, for editing every page of my work. Your meticulous eyes and constant demand for precision greatly improve the quality of my work. Thank you all very, very much, Ivan. Thank you, Benjamin. Over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Jacques de Vreau, uh, also for the opportunity that you gave us uh, to remember Ivan uh, with his own words, uh, which is very much appreciated. Uh, we will continue uh, in that uh, trajectory. Uh, we've been uh, privileged uh, to receive uh, a video message uh, from Ivan's father, uh, Mr. Michael Rujema. Uh, and that video is done uh, on behalf of the Rujema family. Uh, so I would like to ask uh, for that video to be displayed uh, on the screen. Thank you very much. Good evening and warm greetings to you all. I would like to start by thanking the University of Western Cape community, Ivan's home for close to 12 years, for organizing this very special memorial lecture. A special thanks to Professor Jack Deville, Dean of the Faculty of Law at UWC, Professor Sroth Nielsen, former Dean of the Faculty of Law, Professor Yuprov from the University of Missouri, Professor Benyam Dawit Mesmur, Claire Akamanzi, who were a gift and a treasure to Ivan, and will always be considered a member of our family as well as Ivan's friends in Cape Town, Chigari and beyond. Jan, Janine, Philip, Emmanuel, Richard, and anyone I may not have mentioned by name. You remain dear to us all. My family and I, Thank each and every one of you here today for taking the time to be with us as you want Ivan Gema, our son, brother, friend, and colleague. And though it feels like yesterday, it has been six years since Ivan passed home. Ivan was a very special young man. For those of you who had the opportunity to meet and get to know Ivan, I think you will agree with me that he was soft-spoken, kind, hardworking, 
resilient, honest, connected with people effortlessly and with sincerity, respectful, had a quiet humor, humble, and was deeply compassionate and generous. Growing up, Ivan always had a sense of fairness and justice. As my family and I uh, started to speak to, about Ivan, we all recall that if there was ever a moment Ivan was involved in a disagreement, it was because of something or someone was not fair. He used every opportunity he had to make sure everyone whose perspective was heard and we respected each other's differences. It therefore came as no surprise when he chose the law as his area of study and career. As a student at UWC, Ivan earned the bachelor's a Bachelor of Laws degree in 2006, graduating summa cum laude and a Master's of Laws in International Trade and Investment. While at UWC, he was also a recipient of a fellowship to pursue a second Master's degree in Law specializing in dispute resolution at the University of Missouri in the United States, which he completed in 2008. In his own words, Ivan was an eternal student. As such, he chose to share the knowledge he acquired and the path change as a teacher. Like everything Ivan did, I approached it with humility, dedication, and commitment. Beginning in 2009, he lectured at UWC in the Department of Criminal Justice and Procedure. His devotion to his students did not, however, stop in the classroom. He was always available to help those who faced any difficulties, both academically and at a personal level, and as a result, he was often approached by his former students eager to update him on the path their lives had taken. Beyond his work in South Africa, Ivan was deeply committed to his country, Rwanda, and to Africa. He chose a field of study with a view to contributing to the country's legal sector as well as the regional developments. In undertaking his master's degree in law at the University of Missouri, Ivan felt that a course in dispute resolution would be beneficial for a country like Rwanda whose judicial system was struggling to get back to its feet after the events of the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi. He hoped to be involved in the mediation of internal disputes in, his, in Rwanda, as well as between the countries of the continent. The topic for this lecture is therefore befitting to honor Ivan's memory. At this juncture, I would also like to take this the same uh, this time to give special thanks to Professor Samuel JJ. Professor JJ was not only instrumental in Ivan studying at UWC, he was also his teacher and someone that Ivan personally looked up to and looked forward to emulating. We are therefore deeply grateful for Professor Rujeje for accepting to deliver this lecture.
before I conclude. As I have stated, Ivan was a resilient and a young man. Whenever he was faced with any challenges, he faced them with humility and resolve. In his short life, he lived by the mantra, keep walking, and encouraged and challenged his friends when faced with adversity to the same. As a family, on this day, as you remember and celebrate Ivan's life, what you would wish for his friends, former colleagues, and you all is never to give up or be discouraged when faced with any difficulties. Live out your lives in purpose, love, happiness, and the fullest. As you had advocated, let us all keep walking. On behalf of, of the family, I thank you all for your attention and wish you all a good evening. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Michael Rujema, uh, Ivan's father, uh, for delivering that message uh, on behalf of uh, the family. Uh, I will not do justice uh, to what was said, uh, but I just want to highlight uh, two or three points here. Uh, the sense of fairness that you mentioned, if Ivan was involved uh, in any disagreement, it should be about a uh, sense of justice and fairness. His humility, uh, his dedication and commitment. I used to be his uh, next door neighbor. Uh, I sat in office number 16, he was in the next door office. It was something that I witnessed every single day uh, that he actually kept walking with a conscious purpose to achieve something. Uh, and of course, the fact that he made time available to support his current students, uh, but also former students, uh, was something that he lived by uh, on a regular basis. On the program, we have uh, five people that are scheduled to make remarks. Uh, we have heard uh, and we genuinely thank the family uh, for that video, video message on behalf of the family. And I have no doubt that the remarks that will come from the five people that are scheduled to make remarks uh, will supplement, complement uh, and reconfirm uh, what the family knew uh, about Ivan and what we knew of him uh, as a colleague, uh, as a dean, uh, as a classmate uh, and so forth. Uh, the first person scheduled uh, to make that remark uh, is uh, Ms. Caroline Smart uh, from the Department of Criminal Justice and Procedure uh, at UWC. Uh, that is the department uh, that uh, Ivan uh, worked at. Uh, so the floor uh, is uh, open for Ms. Caroline Smart to make her remarks. Over to you. Um, it is an honor as a former colleague to say a few words about Ivan. To me, Ivan was a friend, a colleague, a lecturer, and an exceptional scholar. Um, in whatever role I knew him, he stood um, apart as someone. I think I first met Ivan during undergrad um, studies. I can recall that at the time, everybody wanted to know who was the student that was getting A's for all his subjects. And I was no different. Then at the dean, Merit Awards evening after witnessing his name called for almost every award, um, I met this young, vibrant, wonderful, gracious and brilliant student, Ivan. But little did I know that we would soon co-teach criminal law. And I had the pleasure of working alongside Ivan from 2012 to 2014. Ivan did everything with so much enthusiasm and dedication. Even during his darkest hours, and when one could see that he was in pain, Ivan had a positive attitude about his work, his students, the projects he was busy with, and his career as an academic. And in the beginning of our working relationship, and because I was new, I would often go on a rampage of what and how to do stuff, not knowing where to start. And then in a calm tone, I can clearly hear Ivan say, shot. 
At first, I wasn't sure what he meant by saying shot, but I soon learned that it was his way of bringing calm to my manic um, situation. He was definitely a person of integrity and had a terrific work ethic. Regardless of deadlines or pleasures, he always delivered. I recall during the second semester of 2013 and after a major um, medical treatment, he was so thrilled to be back in office. He started jogging and, he was and we had quite a few discussions about health and exercise. He was excited about life. And at the time, we also had to finalize our examination papers. He had um, 400 plus scripts to marks and various other tasks to complete. And knowing that he just recovered from major medical treatment, I wasn't sure if he was going to cope with certain deadlines. But with Ivan's tenacity, he did. Ivan had so much passion for students. We both shared the passion about enabling students and often we had lengthy discussions on how to deliver a module bearing that in mind. Even in his final few months or on the occasions when we visited him, he always inquired about his students and their progress. It was a privilege for me to be part of his life and although taken from us at such a relatively young age, Ivan was a determined goal-orientated, caring person who truly loved life. He loved his career and he cherished all that life had to offer. It's a little over six years, as his dad mentioned, that our dear colleague and friend has left us. Ivan is surely missed, but never forgotten. Often in our department, we are reminded by things that are akin to Ivan. Thank you that we were fortunate enough to have known him and be part of his life. Thank you very much, um, Caroline. I can uh, really sense that it's emotional for you, uh, but thank you for helping us uh, bring the humanism that uh, he represented. Next, the person who's going to be making the remarks is Ms. Lisa Draga. She's our colleague uh, at the faculty. She's the first recipient of the Ivan Rujema uh, scholarship. The floor is yours. I wasn't quite sure why I was asked to um, give some remarks about Ivan because I'd never had the opportunity of meeting him and my only um, understanding of his character is his big and kind smiles when he walked past me in the passageway. But I decided that I would speak to the caliber of the academics from Missouri who are prepared to support one in the, in the darkest of uh, spaces when one encounters illness. And I decided that Okay. Sorry, um, it seems that my video was off. Um, so I decided that Instead of speaking about Ivan, I would speak about the Missouri academics and their caliber and their character when it comes to supporting students who are afflicted uh, with some sort of illness. And I can only speak to my own experience in Missouri, having gotten very sick and having needed to be hospitalized about how the academics there were prepared to go above and beyond who visited me constantly who encouraged me, who supported me uh, in my attempts to finalize my degree, notwithstanding my despondency and feelings of having failed the program as the pioneer of the program. And the incredible support that I've got from them, I can only imagine that Ivan would have experienced some of that uh, love as well in his process of having studied and being a flagship uh, member of the UWC Missouri program. Thank you very much, uh, Lisa, uh, for sharing those uh, words, including your personal uh, uh, experience. Uh, and um, we really appreciate that you took the time uh, and also uh, managed to say a few things about what the academics in, in, in Missouri were. But we do have someone who was in Missouri at the same time when Ivan was there. 
Uh, in fact, uh, I have to give credit to uh, Lisa. Lisa was the one who said to me when we had this conversation, she said, Zane is actually an excellent person uh, to say a few things about this because he spent a year uh, in Missouri with, uh, with Ivan. When I sent a message uh, to Zane, and I haven't spoken to Zen, uh, I don't know, number of years. I think the last time I saw him was when he was on campus, and it's been a number of years. And when I sent a message to Zen on WhatsApp saying, we're honoring our good friend Ivan, uh, would you be available to say a few words uh, uh, about him? He immediately responded. And he said, it was the honor of my life for one full year that I spent with him uh, in Missouri. So Ivan is an alumnus of UWC. Uh, he is currently a senior manager at Ernest & Young uh, in their Dubai office. Uh, there are a number of other things that I can say about uh, Zane, but I think uh, I'd rather use the time uh, to hear from himself uh, some of the remarks that he wanted to share with us. So Zane, the floor is yours, please. Thank you, Prof. Good to hear from you and good to see you again. I'll, I'll keep my camera off, um, but it's a pleasure uh, hearing from you all. To everyone on the uh, on the call as well, it's, it's, it's really good seeing everyone's names there. Um, our good friend, uh, Richard, as well. So I'll just uh, holler out to him there. And all my uh, honorable lecturers and professors, uh, uh, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, and probably to those uh, in the U.S., good evening. Um, I did have, as you say, Prof, I did have the, the, the honor and benefit of uh, spending time with Ivan. And um, it, it, was, it's a real, it's a real, it was a real moving moment. Um, and if, if I do go over time, just bear with me for a minute or two. Um, so I met Ivan through a good friend uh, of mine, Richard Karugarama. And it was just the year after he had achieved the straight A's that um, uh, Ms. Smart was speaking about. And um, uh, Richard stopped and greeted Ivan and uh, he said, congratulations. And then he introduced me to Ivan. And uh, it, it was a very brief uh, interaction. Um, and uh, it, it was an impressionable one nonetheless. Um, we then both heard of the good news that we were co-beneficiaries of, uh, of, of the scholarship. In a way, I'm very glad that we were co-beneficiaries because I assume if there was only one, it would have been him. So I was very happy to be co-beneficiary of, of, the, of the program with him. Um, but that's when we started planning our stay in, in the United States and when we started, um, you know, starting to get to know each other and, and touching base to, to knowing that we need to uh, rely on each other in, in America. Um, but how Ivan and I spent time together, we stayed for a year in the same house, basically. He was in one room, I was in the next. And every morning we would walk to class together, we'd attend lectures, We'd have lunch together, we'd go back to class together, then we'd have supper together, and then we'd go home. And on the weekends, we'd take a walk around the, 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 the football yard, and we'd go to gym together at the evening. We studied together, we, prayed for, we prepared for exams together. We had intense, long discussions about the law, dispute resolution, politics, our future, our lives, our relationships. The, the feedback we're supposed to bring back to South Africa and Rwanda. He, he really loved um, Rwanda, his country, and he loved South Africa and Cape Town as well. So we'd debate, we'd speak, we'd, we'd argue, we'd discuss, we'd contemplate, and we'd miss home together. It was a wonderful, wonderful um, uh, time with, with Ivan. And he really, he opened my, my way of thinking. But about... Ivan, um, I, I, I can only echo what everyone said, but I, I used to call him, brother. whenever I saw him, I'd call him Brother Ivan or, or just Rujema. Uh, we grew really close together. Um, and the best about Ivan was that he was, as everyone has mentioned, he was a real honorable man. He was a brilliant legal mind and he had a true heart. He walked with purpose, he spoke with purpose, he was very presidential. I always compared him to, at the time, uh, Barack Obama, because uh, at the time as well, 
Prof up off me and him would be would be debating about the U.S. politics, and he reminded me a lot about of uh, uh, President Obama. Uh, he was a deep thinker. He was a very insightful man. He was to, to me able to apply reason and objectivity to every facet of his life, whether it was relationships, friendships, um, and we Ivan and I would only speak about issues and we grapple with issues that really mattered. And he always used his mind in a positive manner. I recall when hearing about his uh, cancer and I, uh, I gave some words of support to him. And as was mentioned on the call as well, uh, he was more upbeat than me about um, beating it. Um, he was diligent, he was uh, conscientious, he, was, he had a strong work, work ethic as well. Um, Importantly, as we all know, he was, he was an intelligent man, but both intellectually and emotionally and psychologically. Um, he always provoked you to think differently, to challenge your biases. When we would debate, he would say, I, 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 I know what you're saying, but what are your sources? Why are you saying this? He would challenge your views. Um, but through all that, he was hectically hilarious and funny. He was very respectful and, and he was always humble. I had the wonderful opportunity of also meeting his parents when they, came, oh, sorry, his father when they came for graduation, his sister and his brother when they came for graduation to Missouri. Uh, and so he welcomed me in his family as well. And I am honored to have spent that time with him and honored to know such a wonderful personality and man. And um, I, I, constantly pray for him as well. So, uh, thank you. That's, that's all from my side. Thank you very much, uh, Zane, uh, for sharing words with us. Uh, they do truly represent uh, who Ivan was. Uh, you did indicate that you actually spent with him uh, a full uh, day for a full year almost uh, while you were in Missouri. Uh, and I'm not quite sure there might be anyone uh, who could have said those things uh, with, from a position of authority, uh, the same way that you've done about uh, his humility, uh, the fact that he debated issues that were of importance uh, and that he was very respectful and so forth and so forth. Thank you very much again. The next speaker uh, is uh, our former Dean, uh, Professor Julia Slosniosen. Uh, when uh, she knew Ivan personally, uh, she was the Dean when Ivan was recruited into the family. And uh, I have no doubt that she would have a few things to share uh, from her interactions uh, and knowledge of uh, Ivan at the moment. Uh, so, Professor Slosniusen, the floor is yours, please. Thank you. <clears throat> when one reflects back on a period as dean, uh, which stretched from the years 2009 to 2013, one, has to, one is tempted, and I think it's inevitable, that one thinks of the staff in terms of who caused the most trouble, who was the most difficult, which people were constant headaches, ones that the students were complaining about, or ones that were the complaining themselves. And for that reason, I have to confess, Ivan doesn't fall into any of those categories. Ivan was, as a staff member, quiet, um, unassuming. He got on with the job in a purposeful manner, he fitted into the faculty very, very well. There were no issues with anybody, no interpersonal uh, difficulties that I was ever made aware of in any respect. Um, he was smart and a very able teacher. There were no student complaints ever. And he was also extremely gentlemanly in both senses of the word, a very gentle man, but also as other people have pointed out, gentlemanly in the sense of respectful and deferent, deferential. Um, he clearly had a huge amount of integrity and as Caroline and um, others have pointed out, was always cheerful. There was never a feeling of discontent or, <coughs> or uh, disquiet on his account at all. So he will be remembered for me as one of my star members of staff during that period of deanship not for all the attention that he focused on himself, but precisely for exactly the opposite reason, that he was 
able to get on with it and to have wonderful relations with his colleagues and with the students. And so I thank him for that. Thank you. Thank you. Th thank you very much, Professor Slosniasen, for sharing those uh, words. Uh, for those of you who uh, probably don't know, Professor Slosniasen uh, is uh, not just only former dean, but is also my personally my former mentor. She was my PhD supervisor. She was my master supervisor. Uh, I know a thing or two about her. Uh, and I know for a fact that uh, she doesn't throw around words so easily. Uh, and I know for a fact that she meant every single of those words uh, that she shared with us. So it was a pleasure to hear those. Uh, and thank you very much uh, for reconfirming what the family knew uh, about Ivan. Uh, the next speaker uh, is uh, Professor Rod Abhoff. Uh, he also knew Ivan uh, at a personal level. Uh, he's from the University of Missouri. Uh, his name has already been mentioned. Uh, and I really appreciate Professor Abhoff and Professor Slosniasen for making the time from your busy schedules to join us. Uh, the floor is yours, Professor Apov. Thank you, and I'm sorry I'm late for this. I was actually the host of another Zoom meeting involving people from UWC and the University of Missouri uh, on a large NIH grant that we are, we are applying for, UWC is applying for, uh, with uh, the help of some uh, people from Missouri, because otherwise I wouldn't, uh, for the life of me, uh, have missed this particular um, Zoom session, but I'm thankful that it's been recorded uh, and I will watch it uh, from the very beginning and I'm sure um, I will tear up. Um, as we all know, Ivan was a very, very special person and he was a very special person to me and my wife, Marsha. Um, and I hope I don't uh, get too choked up on this particular um, at this particular moment, but um, I, I got to know him extremely well when he came to the University of Missouri. Uh, we had many dinners uh, at, at our house as all the UWC students have when they come to Missouri, uh, and that's a time uh, to debate and discuss, um, and it's a, a special time for us to get to know uh, our UWC friends, um, students even better. And, um, Ivan was one of the first, um, and he was here with Zane, as Zane already articulated. Uh, and uh, and I have such such good memories. In fact, my memories were so strong that when um, Ivan passed away, um, we had this scholarship with Lisa Draga as the first recipient, um, and I went to Fred White, who was the donor. Um, who gave us the money to be able to bring um, UWC students over to the University of Missouri. Um, and Fred had met uh, Ivan, um, and Fred was extremely impressed with Ivan, as everyone was who met Ivan. And I said to Fred, um, Fred, I would really like to be able to name um, this scholarship, which at that point was unnamed. Um, I'd really like to name it after Ivan. Um, but since you're the one who's given us um, most of the money uh, for this, um, before I approach UWC about this idea, uh, I wanna make sure you're on board. And Fred, um, Fred said, absolutely. Um, uh, I had thought we should name the scholarship after Fred since he gave us uh, uh, over $400,000 to bring UWC students to the University of Missouri. Um, but Fred said, no, don't name it after me, me name it after Ivan. And, and uh, um, that's what we did. And so uh, the Ivan Regima Scholarship has brought uh, over 20 UWC students um, to the University of Missouri to, to earn their LLM. Um, it's a wonderful experience uh, for UWC students. Uh, it's a wonderful honor for Ivan, um, and it's been uh, great for the University of Missouri as well because they benefited from the intellectual spark uh, of all of the UWC students uh, who have come to our campus. Um, but Ivan, Ivan was, and I don't want any of the others who are on this call to feel bad, uh, but Ivan was indeed very special. And uh, when he went back to UWC and began uh, as a lecturer and working on his PhD, he actually taught uh, in our winter school program with UWC. 
uh, and Mike Middleton, who uh, was the former um, president of the University of Missouri, also a law faculty member, co-taught with Ivan. Uh, and Mike told me um, after that experience uh, that he thought um, Ivan was one of the most talented young teachers that he had ever worked with. So, um, so I think that's about all I can say about Ivan, except he will always remain um, a, a very special person in my heart. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Professor Apo. Thank you, Mark. Um, I really appreciate taking the time to share with us. I, I know it's an emotional time for many of us. Um, before you came, there were a couple of us who actually also choked. But as we said, it's an opportunity to celebrate Ivan's life, and what he stood for, uh, and the human being that he was. Let me just make a few remarks uh, from my side, uh, and I will hand over uh, to uh, our colleague, Professor Patricia Lenahan, uh, who will help us uh, to moderate uh, the public lecture. Uh, we spoke quite a bit about Ivan. Uh, the family shared with us uh, who Ivan was to them. Uh, the dean, of course, drew our attention to uh, Ivan's own words, uh, which is very much uh, appreciated. I want to do briefly uh, something similar, uh, take us back to some of his own words. Uh, and I got this from his social media platform. Uh, uh, and I quote, this is how he described himself on his timeline, uh, on his profile on, on, on Twitter. Rwandan and global citizen, educator and eternal student. I stand on the shoulders of giants so that I can see more than they and then he put dot, dot, dot. Now, some people put in their social media profile uh, what they aspire to be. They, they put a quote. Uh, in fact, some people put in their social media platform uh, something that's not really true. Uh, that's why uh, we do have these days this saying that says, uh, I wish your life is uh, as beautiful as you make it look like on social media because people post and brag uh, and, and, uh, and posture and so forth. Now. Having read this, Rwandan and global citizen, he was proudly Rwandan. He made sure that you knew about that fact. In fact, for me, having heard some of the words that were used about humility and his development and his hope uh, and his happiness and so forth, I couldn't think uh, further beyond the Rwandan flag and what the three colors of the Rwandan flag actually represent blue, green, and yellow, happiness, peace, development, uh, and of course the green band uh, representing hope. So Ivan was a Rwandese in every sense of the word, and as I said earlier, he was an Inyanga Mungayo at that. But he was a Pan-Africanist at heart as well. That's why he probably put, and I'm guessing here, but I've known him as a Pan-Africanist and there's no doubt about that. He was a Pan-Africanist at heart in every sense of the word. You could have a debate with him about regional integration, you could have a debate with him about corruption, about imperialism, uh, about democracy, about gender equality and, and African Cup of Nations or basketball. He saw a lot of things from a global perspective, but he, he was also a very humble African. He was a Pan-Africanist at heart in every sense of the word. Now the third part where he says he's, the second part, educator and eternal student. He, I mean, he could have said a university lecture, or he could have put his both masters and summa cum laude and so forth there. But that's not Ivan, because he's very humble. He's, his humility is at the core of what he does. And he's not just only an educator, and I'm speaking for myself here, but also probably for, for many other people. Not just only educator in the context of the classroom. He was educator in more ways than one in the lives that he touched. And I'm just going to share one personal example here. I bumped into him one day in the corridors, uh, and as he always does, he was in a rush. In fact, I got to see Ivan and have more conversations with him over the weekends because I used to go to the office over the weekends as well every now and then, and he used to as well. Uh, but I bumped into him and he said he's in a rush because he said someone broke into his car uh, because he had left an old jacket in the back uh, and he needed to get that uh, part of his car's window fixed. And I said, I said to him, it's very unfortunate. 
uh, because I mean, and he said, no, I know it's very unfortunate because it's, take, it's, it's disrupting my schedule. But you know, he said, Ben, if someone could break a car's window to get us an old jacket, he said to me, the first question that I need to ask myself is not to be angry, but to ask myself, what was in that person's mind? How much in need was he? How much in an unfortunate situation was he to actually go to that mile? So he, he was sympathizing. And that is something that I've learned from him. So when he says an educator, not just only in the classroom, but outside in the lives that he touched. The third element, uh, the, still part of the educator, eternal student. One word that Ivan used to say was, he learned every single day. And in every sense of the word, he was an eternal student. And the third element that says, I stand on the shoulders of giants so that I can see more than they, is definitely his humbleness, his humility, uh, that is reflected uh, in, in, in that uh, profile uh, that he has provided in Twitter. So I thought I would share that on a personal level. Uh, I thought that when I was preparing the program for today's event, uh, I was not going to create uh, a slot for myself uh, because I realized that I would actually talk, uh, but I'm glad that I've been able uh, to share these few words. Our next person who's going to take us through the conversation uh, is Professor uh, Patricia Lenahan. Uh, she has known Ivan uh, from his undergraduate days. Uh, she is in the Department of American in Labor Law. She knows quite a lot about uh, dispute resolution. Uh, and of course, she also was colleagues, very good colleagues, with Professor Justice uh, Sam Rujeje. Uh, and we couldn't think of anyone better than Professor Patricia Lenahan uh, to take us through uh, the next part of the conversation. So thank you for agreeing. Uh, over to you, Professor Lenhan. Thank you very much, Benyam. It's truly my pleasure to introduce um, Professor Sam Rajeje, um, our speaker today, former Chief Justice and a former colleague of ours at UWC. I'm going to read from the resume that was included in the invitation because it encapsulates it very well. Sam Rajeje retired in December 2019 after eight years as Chief Justice and eight years as Deputy Chief Justice of Rwanda. He was educated at Makerere University, Uganda, Yale Law School and the University of Oxford, where he obtained LLB, LLM and D4 respectively. He started off as a lecturer in law at Makerere University before being forced to flee the terror of the Idi Amin regime in 1976. He then taught at the universities of Lesotho and Eswatini. Before being elevated to the bench, Rajeje was a professor at the University of the Western Cape, teaching constitutional law and post-apartheid land reform. While at UWC, Rajeje acted as a consultant to the commission that drafted the post-genocide Rwanda constitution, which ushered in a new era providing for respect for the rule of law, independence of the judiciary, fundamental human rights and freedoms, equitable power sharing, as well as a commitment to national unity, reconciliation, and peaceful resolution of disputes. As Chief Justice, Rujeji was responsible for developing judicial policy and presided over the Supreme Court whenever on the panel. He oversaw land reforms, including use of court technologies continuing legal education and specialization training of judges. Under his watch, access to justice was enhanced through constitutional challenges, public interest litigation, and the promotion of court annexed mediation. For 10 years, Justice Rujeji was also principal judge of the first instance division of the Court of Justice of the Common Market for Eastern and Southern Africa, Kumesa an ad hoc court dealing with commercial disputes arising in the common market. Justice Rujeje was elected Honorary Fellow of St. Peter's College, Oxford. In recognition of outstanding achievements in the field of law, he was honoured by the East African Law Society in recognition of distinguished service to the legal profession and by the Rwandan Bar Association for outstanding contribution to the development of the legal profession and justice in Rwanda. It is my pleasure to put forward Professor Sam Rujeji. Thank you very much. Hello, Professor Lenahan. Good afternoon, Sam. Good 
to see you, Patricia. Uh, I'm so happy to be participating in this uh, remembrance of uh, our friend and colleague and student, Ivan Rujema. Um, a lot has been said about him and uh, I can't say uh, anything different except to affirm uh, that uh, uh, he was a decent human being, humble, respectful, and friendly. He was always eager to learn. As my uh, countryman, um, we got along well, and uh, he often came to my office just to chat or to talk about his academic work. Despite the fact that he was so brilliant, he was always asking questions, always trying to know more. And uh, I think uh, it is right that he, he called himself an eternal student. Uh, he always wanted to know, to know more. Uh, again, as the Professor uh, Mesmo said, he loved his country and uh, we talked a lot about Rwanda and its future. I remember one time uh, he came to our house in uh, Rwanda Bosch and uh, we spent the day with him and his friend uh, Richard Karl uh, Garama uh, talking about Rwanda and South Africa and the uh, peace and reconciliation. When he came, when I was here in Rwanda um, some years ago as the Deputy Chief Justice, he visited me at the Supreme Court and we discussed about his future, his uh, hopes, his intention to do a PhD. And uh, we talked about different uh, areas he could uh, uh, do it in. And one of the, his interests, of course, was the dispute resolution, in which he has done a master's at the uh, University of Missouri. And uh, uh, when the family asked me to give a lecture on this occasion uh, in collaboration with UWC, I thought that the best I could talk about was the dispute resolution in Rwanda. Um, dispute, alternative dispute resolution uh, has been a culture in Africa and in Rwanda uh, for centuries, and it is still very important to us in Rwanda. And therefore, I'm, I'm happy to be talking about it. It's a, long, a large topic. I hope I will not take too long and bore you. Uh, one of the uh, interviews that uh, Ivan did uh, was uh, uh, in talking about his future and his uh, his hopes about when he was at the uh, University of Missouri. And he said, uh, a course in dispute resolution would be beneficial to Rwanda, whose judiciary was struggling to get back to its feet after the events of 1994, genocide against the Tutsi. He hoped to transfer knowledge that he acquired from the uh, University of Missouri to the people of Rwanda and South Africa working in the legal system. He also, uh, as uh, Professor Benyam said, uh, he was a, not just a patriot, mm -hmm. but also a Pan-Africanist. And uh, he talked about the conflicts in Africa. He said that uh, knowledge of alternative dispute resolution would help in resolving disputes, conflicts in Africa. 
and he hoped to be involved in mediating peace in those countries of Africa. So I thought we should look at uh, both uh, pre-colonial and current dispute resolution mechanisms and see how they relate to each other and what contribution they've made to, to Rwanda. Uh, like in many other societies, family in Rwanda is central and has always been. And the first dispute resolution was the family council. I'm sure it was the same in other uh, pre-colonial societies. Things have changed now in many countries, but uh, in Rwanda, we still have family councils. The objective of uh, all uh, dispute resolution mechanisms in Rwanda were to amicably resolve disputes and to bring people back together and establish peace and uh, harmony. They did it through dialogue, mediation, conciliation, leading to reconciliation of those who were in dispute, forgiveness and restoration of peaceful relations and harmony in the family and uh, consequently, in the community. The family interests and community interests were community interests were more important than uh, individual interests. Individual interests have become important in the modern society, but uh, family was always uh, first and still is first in social relations. The family council consisted of the head of the family and the male adults of the extended family in an attempt to reconcile the disputing parties, usually over land, over succession, over damage to property and uh, domestic matters. The proceedings were always informal, uh, allowing everyone to speak, to say what they knew about the dispute and to identify, to help the, the gathering, to identify the wrongdoer, admonish that person, give advice and therefore uh, resolve the dispute. Usually it ended up in the restitution or reparations for the damage done or the wrong done and an apology. Usually beer was shared at the end of the session as a sign of reconciliation. Many Traditional institutions were, however, undermined by the colonial rule, but uh, family councils survived. They survived because the state or the administration had no role in enforcement of uh, uh, what had been decided by the family council. Enforcement depended on respect and fear of uh, isolation or withdrawal of family support, which was very important, including security. You could not be secure in pre-colonial society without the support of your family and your community. In the post-genocide era, the family councils are still operational. They are recognized by law and they are encouraged. This is in order to promote peace and stability and progress because 
peace and stability, and the progress of a society starts in the family, extends to the community, and to the nation. The law on persons and the family uh, says in Article 162, the Family Council is an organ within the family, especially responsible for ensuring the safeguard of interests of the family members and settling the disputes arising in the family. The next article says the council has the responsibility to listen to and settle disputes relating to succession and any other disputes arising in the family and to mediate when parents of a child have disputes over parental authority. They also deal with disputes on maintenance obligations, which is important to um, family relations today. They do guardianship and adoption. So they, unlike the pre-colonial uh, all male council, today's family council consists of male and female. The law says the father, the mother, and adult siblings of the concerned person must be members, and at least two relatives, and two wise people chosen by the concerned person. The word mentioned by Professor Nyanga Mugayo, members of councils have to be Nyanga Mugayo, honest and persons of integrity. The decisions reached were are reached by consensus and failing consensus by majority. The decision must be recorded and signed because today there are legal consequences. If a, a family council takes a decision on succession, it can be enforced. Uh, and if it is disputed, the court will always ask for the decision of the uh, family council. Uh, after the family council, if there was a no agreement in the pre-colonial period it would go to a gachacha forum you've all heard about gachacha it has become famous in the pre-colonial period it was still an informal gathering of uh, heads of families and close advisors the nyangamugayo or wise men of the uh, community who were close. The Gachacha resolved disputes that could not be resolved at the family council or where more than one family were involved. The, their purpose was the same, to try and amicably resolve the dispute and reconcile the the parties to establish peace and harmony within the uh, families, the two families. Um, a dispute belonged to the family. It was not a dispute of one party, especially if there was more than uh, one family involved. The family took responsibility to prosecute the dispute before the gachacha and if they were found liable, then they would uh, communally uh, pay the fine or the, the uh, uh, compensation uh, for the wrong done. However, the church, like other institutions, was devalued by colonialism. Uh, the church, uh, was more, many of the functions that it was performing or the cases it was adjudicating were taken away and given to administrators of the colonial uh, administrators. 
of the colonial regime. However, even in post-colonial time, the first two regimes did not give sufficient uh, respect to gachacha and only used them to deal with petty offenses. However, after 1994, gachacha were revived, this time as the official institutions. They were given the responsibility to handle genocide cases, to deal with the thousands, the hundreds of thousands of accused persons accused of participation in genocide. This was largely because of the appalling state of the justice institutions at the time, with many judges and prosecutors having either been killed or fled the country because they had participated in genocide. The attempt to deal with the genocide cases uh, in conventional courts was uh, unsuccessful. It became clear that in order to deal with all the uh, all the cases, they will probably would need a hundred years to complete these cases. And therefore, a different solution had to be found. Of course, there was talk about amnesty. There was talk about uh, truth and reconciliation, like had just happened in uh, South Africa. Archbishop Tutu himself came to Rwanda and tried to persuade uh, the decision makers here and the people uh, to go the truth and reconciliation road. However, the Rwandese were not happy with amnesty because it, it was partly responsible for the genocide. Since 1959, uh, people had committed atrocities and got away with it because they got amnesty from the state. Now, after the 59, 60s, 70s, uh, there were atrocities until the genocide. That is, people say it was partly because of these amnesties that people thought they could commit genocide and get out with it. So gachacha were reintroduced as a solution, as a uh, traditional fora that could use um, non-lawyers to administer justice. Since they did the same in the pre-colonial period, they could do it now, especially because genocide was committed uh, in broad daylight, in front of uh, lots of witnesses, there was uh, little to it. The evidence was there. So even ordinary people could decide cases of their uh, compatriots who had committed those crimes. The, so the purpose of uh, the modernized gachacha was to eradicate the culture of impunity, uh, to administer justice for the victims and the suspects, and to attempt reconciliation and mending of the social fabric that was torn apart and reestablished trust in the community. It was hoped that if this happened, then people could move forward in unity towards social economic development. As I said, the judges were lay persons elected for their integrity, male and female, young adults and older adults. It was participatory justice, uh, community justice, uh, similar to the traditional era. There was a minimum of formality no lawyers, no judges, and therefore no 
objections no or postponement of cases it was uh, uh, it moved fast enough for them to be able to complete over almost two million cases uh, by 2012 that was about 10 years uh, on the other hand you remember that uh, ictr within the same period or even longer decided only 80 cases at a much higher cost uh, although there was punishment for those who were found guilty there was also an opportunity for people to uh, to confess, to show remorse, to cooperate in the finding uh, where the, the perished persons could be remains were found could be found. These were incentives to reduced sentences or to have uh, the sentences. Uh, suspended or commuted to community service. Uh, there was a program of community service uh, for those who uh, cooperated with the, uh, the justice uh, to serve part of their sentences in prison and the other part to uh, perform it while they were in their homes or in the community. Uh, buildings to perform public works and also to assist in rebuilding uh, what had been destroyed. They also built houses for victims of genocide or survivors. There was also an opportunity during the Chacha for perpetrators to apologize, which helped the, both the survivors and the perpetrators uh, towards healing and uh, moving on with life. The church has been criticized for uh, not having defense lawyers, using uh, lay judges, inadequate time to prepare. But this must be seen in the context of uh, genocide and the circumstances that uh, there were no resources even if you wanted to have lawyers in those courts thousands of gachacha uh, courts there were not enough lawyers to go around and there were not enough uh, judges to uh, to be able to adjudicate in these uh, cases so Looking at the uh, achievements of this bachacha, of this uh, homegrown uh, solution based on tradition, we not only see a lot of the cases resolved or de decided, but a lot of truth came out. A lot of uh, victims could be found and rebutted in, in dignity. There were apologies by those who accepted uh, their wrong, who realized that they had uh, behaved uh, inhumanely and wanted to be reintegrated back into their societies as normal people. This contributed to peace stability and uh, improvement in the economy that we see today in Rwanda. But the Chacha courts came to an end in 2012 when they finished the assignment, uh, but that was not the end of uh, uh, homegrown solutions uh, based on uh, culture. We also have the Abunzi uh, mediation committees as a dispute resolution uh, mechanism. We again, we trace Abunzi back into the colonial, uh, pre-colonial period where they were a level of dispute resolution just above Gachacha. They 
involved uh, the elders of the two families, the heads of families and the elders, but also involved the chief of the village, uh, who then uh, led the discussions towards uh, resolving the dispute. The, chair, the, the village chief, who was more of a clan chief, was uh, involved because now the matter had gone beyond the two families. They could not agree. It affected the harmony of the community as a whole. And uh, they uh, also attempted to bring uh, peace in the community, to bring the two families together, re-establish harmony. In the modern times, we still have Abunzi again reintroduced in the uh, post-genocide uh, period by the constitution of 2003, which established them to be responsible for conciliating parties in conflict with the aim of consolidating national unity and peaceful coexistence among Rwandans. The same purpose as was uh, in pre-colonial period. However, here it is regulated by law and supervised by the Ministry of Justice. However, the same as in the old times, the emphasis is on who does the conciliation. It has to be Minyanga Mugayo the persons of integrity, this time uh, irrespective of gender, because now at least 30% of the Abunzi uh, uh, panel must be women. There is a lot of uh, emphasis on gender equality in Rwanda, as you must know. This, uh, uh, panel of conciliators is chosen by the uh, disputing parties themselves. The community elects uh, seven members of their community and the parties, each time there is a dispute, are free to choose three of those seven to decide their cases. So that is this uh, process is also participatory, it is public and aimed at reaching the truth and reconciling the parties. However, the modernization of this part is that if they do not, if they do not agree on a solution, then the conciliators uh, take a decision write it down, make it into some form of judgment, and it can be enforced. Only if the, uh, one of the parties cannot accept the decision, then uh, they have to go to the primary court. But you can see that the emphasis is still on peaceful, uh, resolution of disputes within the community so that people can go on. The impact of uh, this uh, uh, Abunzi mediation uh, mechanism or conciliation mechanism is that it has reduced the court backlog uh, considerably. 97% of potential court cases are resolved by Abunzi, only 3% going to the courts. And the people are happy with the process. Uh, according to a survey by the uh, Rwanda Governance Board, 78% of the population are happy with the, what the Abunzi are doing. They prefer them to courts because obviously uh, they are 
they are free. Uh, so they don't have to spend money on courts and lawyers. Uh, they are closer to, to them. So there is an element of access to justice. Uh, and uh, perhaps importantly, uh, because they don't have to go to court, more time is devoted to economic activity with an impact on uh, household income and to the national economy. So it contributes to peaceful coexistence after resolution. Uh, they reconcile and continue good relations. Then uh, we have modern forms of ADR. Uh, we have to say that although albums are very successful, they are popular, they are accepted, they only handle uh, relatively minor cases or uh, cases that are not more than uh, uh, 3 million uh, one and francs, which is about $3,000, which is not a lot. So what about other disputes? Other disputes have to go to court or they have to find another uh, ADR forum. So we have um, been, the, in Rwanda, we've been pushing for uh, more uh, alternative dispute resolution mechanisms that can handle cases uh, beyond the 3 million of the Abonzi. Government has introduced uh, uh, arbitration and conciliation law in 2008. Uh, it has uh, ratified the New York Convention on Arbitration and established an arbitration center, the Kigali International Arbitration Center. All this is uh, in the context of the country's vision for accelerated economic development. In order to have that, you need foreign investment and you need internal domestic investment. All this has to happen in an environment where uh, enforcement of contracts is reliable, where they are uh, business people can resolve their disputes uh, in an environment that is uh, confidential that they can trust. Uh, and it is in that context that uh, this uh, uh, arbitration center was set up and the laws uh, amended. So far, that international arbitration center has resolved 165 international and domestic arbitrations, perhaps not a great deal, but as I understand it, very good uh, within the African market. There are other African uh, arbitration centers which have not had any cases at all. Uh, so the, the center has also trained arbitrators and train the judges so that they can handle any reviews uh, properly. And the impact of this is that investor confidence in uh, Rwanda has increased. There are um, independent uh, assessments to that effect, uh, including the World Bank, um, Doing, is of doing business uh, reports, which has have put Rwanda number two for a number of years. Uh, and uh, currently it is at number 38 in the world out of 190 countries, which I think is quite commendable. So Rwanda enjoys a good reputation among investors, partly due to a highly developed uh, dispute resolution system in the country, according to African business. Uh, but 
as you may know, uh, arbitration is expensive. I don't think it is only in Rwanda, but worldwide arbitration tends to be expensive and sometimes the preserve of elite business businesses it is limited it has limited access in the African countries uh, African ordinary Africans even business people uh, may not afford uh, those uh, uh, fees of arbitration uh, although indeed we need to do much more to domesticate arbitration so that it is not seen as some uh, international uh, forum which is expensive and unaffordable. Uh, so in any case, after arbitration we look at uh, mediation which is another alternative dispute resolution mechanism and uh, although it has the similarities to to arbitration it is quite different the or where the where arbitrators uh, have the last word and they control the process in mediation uh, parties control the process and have to agree to the result of the mediation. Uh, although they share speed and confidentiality with arbitration, uh, there is much more control in mediation. The, uh, the, the other advantage of mediation is that uh, People are given an opportunity to talk to each other, uh, to express their grievances, their frustrations, and their interests and their expectations. So through that discussion and, uh, of the two parties, they understand each other and may reach an agreement which is acceptable to both parties. So unlike the winner-loser uh, scenario, of uh, arbitration and litigation, the mediation has uh, uh, the, the opportunity for the, the context or the uh, framework of reconciling the parties, which is closer to our traditional way of dealing with disputes. So where do we stand now with mediation in Rwanda? I must say that uh, not where we want to be. Mediation is very new as a practice in Rwanda, but we are working very hard on it with the full backing of the judiciary and other state uh, institutions. Uh, over the last uh, uh, couple of years, there has been training of uh, lawyers and judges uh, on mediation skills, uh, thanks to uh, the Edwards Academy uh, and the generosity of Bruce Edwards uh, of uh, Edwards Mediation Academy, uh, who has offered his uh, online course uh, to uh, Rwandans. Uh, and also to thanks to uh, judge retired judge Daniel Weinstein of the Weinstein International Foundation, who has facilitated financially the training of lawyers and others who need mediation skills, and has also uh, financed uh, the uh, create or the the preparation of a manual for guidance of mediators and other activities. Um, more recently, again, uh, the judiciary has taken the initiative to start court annexed mediation, whereby 
mediations can be done in court by judges or registrars, but also uh, by reference to private mediators. Because there has been training of mediators, the uh, Chief Justice has uh, uh, accredited uh, a number of uh, mediators who have been trained uh, to be able to be given cases that they can mediate from the courts. Uh, there is a, also a, a, an awareness campaign going on uh, through radio talks, television talks, and through the uh, print media, uh, promoting mediation as a way of resolving uh, disputes amicably, uh, showing the people that uh, they'll save time, they'll save money, they'll save uh, emotional distress that they would get if they went through a court process. Court processes can take 10 years uh, in, a, in a, our countries where uh, we have a lot of uh, case backlogs. Uh, it is, it, it is uh, much quicker to go for mediation, and especially in cases like family, uh, where people do not want to wash their dirty linen in the public. Uh, mediation offers them uh, an opportunity to reach an agreement or a settlement on their differences. Uh, the next week, there will be a mediation awareness week uh, where the uh, message is mediation is a pillar of justice that strengths that strengthens Rwandan society. In other words, you get justice, but you also have a chance to reconcile and live uh, peacefully together. Uh, there has also been a, uh, an ADR policy in the, in, in the process, uh, which is awaiting uh, approval by government and which will lead to legislation uh, that will regulate uh, ADR as a profession. And we believe that that will even accelerate the use of mediation. There is, of course, resistance by lawyers. Uh, some of them think that uh, mediation will take bread away from them because there will be no appeals. Uh, they will not get as much as they used to get through the court process. But uh, they're also being trained and made more aware that they can benefit from mediation. Um, so we hope that uh, may, there is a new enthusiasm and impetus for mediation, and uh, it may lead to mainstreaming of mediation which would expand access to justice, diminish conflict, and enhance harmony of in the society, therefore, thereby contributing to economic development. There is uh, something else that uh, uh, Ivan was talking about, I think I mentioned it at the beginning, that he was not happy about the uh, conflict in Africa, intercommunal, tribal, religious conflicts uh, that have dogged Africa for many years. And he hoped to uh, participate in resolving these uh, conflicts. However, uh, in Rwanda, we haven't been uh, we haven't directly been involved in international mediation of these conflicts. However, Rwanda has uh, been involved in peacekeeping since 2005. 
which is close, as close as we can get to contributing to peace in these conflicts. Uh, the Rwandese uh, armed forces and, uh, and police forces have been in peacekeeping missions to Haiti, Central African Republic, Sudan, South Sudan, Mali, Liberia, Ivory Coast, and others. To assist, they assist not only in security, but also in community engagement, giving uh, the experiences of Rwanda as examples of how people can recover from a conflict and live peacefully together. So, although uh, we have not directly resolved any disputes internationally, we have contributed to peace in that context. In conclusion, I would say that uh, as we started off, uh, peaceful resolution of disputes have always been part of African culture and should continue to do so. Uh, although it was undermined under colonial and post-colonial administration, they have recovered and been given a, with their rightful place in modern society. They have contributed to peace, to stability, and social and economic development. Modern forms of ADR have also contributed to that, especially in providing the framework for attracting investors and hence economic progress. Ivan had a vision of peace and development in his country, Rwanda, and on his continent, Africa. It is evident that many in Rwanda share his vision and are doing what they can to realize that vision. But it is back in progress. Aluta continua. I thank you for your attention and I thank UWC for inviting me to be part of this and also the family. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Professor Sam Rajeche. It was a privilege to hear you speak, not only on the well-known role of the Kokatra, but also on Ubunzi and the standing that Rwanda enjoys in the international community because of its success in international dispute resolution. Um, I'm aware of the fact that we have some time for questions to you and that you've requested that these questions be placed in the chat forum. So I'm going to maybe give time for, for a raising of hands and then if you could, following raising your hands, maybe just populate your questions in the chat room as requested by Prof. Rajeji. Perhaps just questions. It can also be uh, contributions in terms of uh, ideas or uh, reactions. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that, Sam. From my side, um, maybe while people are thinking of their reactions or their contributions, I just want to say how much I appreciated how you drew the, the connection to Ivan and the kind of person he was and how these um, family councils and, and, and forums are, are based on the integrity of, of whoever presides and how Ivan in his quest for peace, not only in Rwanda, but also in the African continent, so resemble those characteristics and attributes that would have made him such a wonderful contributor to many of these dispute settlement forums. 
I see there is someone that has populated someone in the chat. Um, I see that Professor Vivian Lavoc has um, raised a comment in the ch a chat in which she mentions that she likes the mediation week in Rwanda and uh, the progress in court annex mediation is very slow in South Africa. I also would like to concur with what Prof. Lavoc has said there that I love the motto that um, mediation strengthens the Rwandan society. And the thread that mediation and um, the Kokacha and as well as the Ubunzi has used to look at reconciliation and participatory justice and as a means of addressing conflicts to strengthen the Rwandan society and the role of Rwanda in, in, in Africa. Um, Paula has also said that she's grateful for a very informative lecture um, and ways that she thinks she will asks in what ways do you um, think the international system or courts of law could learn from pre-colonial justice mechanisms such as those that you described and then there's also a question from Lorenzo Wakefield and um, maybe if we give opportunity for you to address Paula's question yeah. Okay, uh, I think I can see uh, Lorenzo Wakefield's uh, question um, talking about uh, stored uh, legal aid bill and uh, whether I can play a role in advocating for people centered justice. Uh, I, I think. I am, I am available to uh, assist where, wherever they seek my uh, assistance. Uh, right now, uh, I've been uh, uh, appointed or made uh, a chair of the uh, mediation advisory committee which advises the judiciary on the implementation of uh, uh, the uh, court and next mediation program uh, and also we are following up with the minister of justice on uh, uh, the policy hoping that uh, uh, it will come out soon and that we shall have legislation that regulates mediation. So also regarding legal aid, uh, I know we have a problem about uh, legal aid uh, in our country. There are many people who go to court without uh, legal assistance because they can't afford. Uh, but also I think the reason it has delayed is not uh, for lack of uh, attention, uh, but perhaps because uh, it is a question of affordability uh, and the priorities uh, in terms of do you uh, support people to pay money that you would otherwise be spending on health or education. Uh, so there is an issue of uh, priority uh, here. And I know there are people uh, who would perhaps disagree with me on this, but this is what I think is the problem, that it is weighing priorities. But uh, well, I'm happy to assist wherever. Uh, how has the legal processes helped address the psychological legacy in healing the wounds of genocide? Um, thinking particularly about models that could help people, communities suffering prolonged systemic oppression and its attendant levels of brutality and pain. Uh, 
my thoughts on helping people uh, suffering uh, psychological legacy of, of genocide. Obviously, there are people still suffering uh, trauma from uh, genocide. Uh, they are assisted wherever it is possible. Uh, uh, but we still have a, uh, a, a, a low level of manpower uh, in uh, handling psychological health. Um, but uh, they're doing what they can, especially through uh, the uh, sub which is a, a, a vehicle of government to support survivors. Some of the psychological problems can not of survivors. So I think there's a, uh, a effort to video day uh, their suffering and their and their trauma. Uh, I don't know whether there's another question. Sam? Yes. Um, I've been advised by Professor Mesmer that the question by Umish Baba would be the last question that and, uh, and uh, point put forward to you. There's also many thanks coming in from all the people in, in, in the audience expressing their thanks to you. But I'm not going to jump through on that. I'm going to hand over to the DVC academic, Professor Lavoc, to express her word of gratitude and appreciation. Um, I can see Prof Mesmer is there first. So thank you, thank you so much, Sam. Thanks again. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you very much. It's been an absolute treat. Uh, in fact, for my colleagues at UWC, last month we had the former Deputy Chief Justice of South Africa, Moseneke. Uh, and of course, today we have the former Chief Justice of Rwanda. Uh, so it's been an absolute treat uh, in October, uh, but also in November. And thank you very much uh, for all those inputs that have been provided. Uh, before I hand over to Professor Labak, I would like to ask for everybody's indulgence. If you can permit us, we want to play the video of the family, the Rujema family again. Uh, earlier, the, the, the volume was not great. Uh, we had tasted it earlier, it was okay. It's one of those things, but I'm hoping that you can indulge us for about seven minutes and then we will immediately end after that. Uh, so I'm just gonna ask, especially for those that were not here earlier, you, you will also get the opportunity to listen to that important message from the family. I'm going to ask uh, our colleague to play the video uh, one last time. Thank you very much for your indulgence and please stay around for that video. Good evening and warm greetings to you all. I would like to start by thanking the University of Western Cape Ecumenite. Ivan is home for close 12 years for organizing this very special memorial lecture. A special thanks to Professor Jack Deville, Dean of the Faculty of Law at UWC, Professor Scott Nielsen, former Dean of the Faculty of Law, Professor Yuphoff from the University of Missouri, Professor Benyam Dawit Mizmur, Claire Akamanzi, who are a gift and a treasure to Ivan, who will always be considered a member of our family, as well as Ivan's friends in Cape Town, Chigari, and beyond. Diane, Janine, Philip, Emmanuel, Richard, and anyone I may not have mentioned by name, you may be dear 
to us all. My family and I thank each and every one of you here today for taking the time to be with us as you want I Ivan Gema, our son, brother, friend, and colleague. And though it feels like yesterday, it has been six years since Ivan passed on. Ivan was a very special young man. For those of you who had the opportunity to meet and get to know Ivan, I think you will agree with me that he was softly spoken, kind, hardworking, resilient, honest, connected with people effortlessly and with sincerity, respectful, had a quiet humor, humble, and was deeply compassionate and generous. Growing up, Ivan always had a sense of fairness and justice. As my family and I uh, sat to speak to, about Ivan, we all recall that if there was ever a moment Ivan was involved in a disagreement, it was because of something or someone who was not fair. He used every opportunity he had to make sure everyone whose perspective was heard and they respected each other's differences. It therefore came as no surprise when he chose the law as his area of study and career. As a student at UWC, Ivan earned the bachelor's a Bachelor of Laws degree in 2006, graduating summa cum laude and a Master's of Laws in International Trade and Investment. While at UWC, he was also a recipient of a fellowship to pursue a second Master's degree in Law specializing in dispute resolution at the University of Missouri in the United States, which he completed in 2008. In his own words, Ivan was an eternal student. As such, he chose to share the knowledge he acquired and the path change as a teacher. Like everything Ivan did, I approached it with humility, dedication, and commitment. Beginning in 2009, he lectured at UWC in the Department of Criminal Justice and Procedure. His devotion to his students did not, however, stop in the classroom. He was always available to help those who faced any difficulties, both academically and at a personal level. And as a result, he was often approached by his former students eager to update him on the path their lives had taken. Beyond his work in South Africa, Ivan was deeply committed to his country, Rwanda, and to Africa. He chose a field of study with a view to contributing to the country's deco sector as well as the regional developments. In undertaking his master's degree in law at the University of Missouri, Ivan felt that a course in dispute resolution would be beneficial for a country like Rwanda whose judicial system was struggling to get back to its feet after the events of the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi. He hoped to be involved in the mediation of internal disputes in, his, in Rwanda, as well as between 
the countries of the continent. The topic for this lecture is therefore befitting to honor Ivan's memory. At this juncture, I would also like to take this in the same uh, this time to give special thanks to Professor Samuel J.J. Professor J.J. was not only instrumental in Ivan in studying at UWC, he was also his teacher and someone that Ivan personally looked up to and looked forward to emulating. We are therefore deeply grateful for Professor J.J. for accepting to deliver this lecture. Before I conclude, as I stated, Ivan was a resilient and young man. Whenever he was faced with any challenges, he faced them with humility and resolve. In his short life, he lived by the mantra, keep walking, and encouraged and challenged his friends when faced with adversity to the same. As a family, on this day, as you remember and celebrate Ivan's life, what we would wish for his friends, former colleagues, and you all is never to give up or be discouraged when faced with any difficulties. Live out your lives with purpose, love, happiness, and the fullest. As you had advocated, let us all keep walking. On behalf of, of the family, I thank you all for your attention and wish you all a good evening. Thank you very much. Uh, I am sure you agree with me that uh, it was the right decision that we played the video one more time. Uh, and even though technology was not on our side earlier, we've been able to overcome that. At the beginning, I said that organizing this event uh, was almost effortless because uh, we, I don't have, as I said, anyone who said, let me check about it, let me think about it, because it was about Ivan. And we basically marched with a common purpose to make it happen. But it doesn't mean that uh, there is no one who worked behind the scenes and planned and executed. So it's time for final remarks uh, from the DVC academic, Professor Lavak. She's our DVC academic who happens to be a lawyer. She knows a lot about dispute resolution uh, and has a lot of connection with many of the countries on the continent. So thank you very much for being here and it's over to you. Um, thank you very much, Program Director, Professor Mesmu. Um, I like the description of what I'm about to do, which is, and it gives me a great pleasure to do so uh, very briefly. It says a, a word of appreciation. I would like to then express my appreciation to all those that were working behind the scenes. And I want to mention here particularly um, the Dean of the Faculty, Professor Jacques de Vol, the Program Director that, that pulled all of this together with the help of his colleagues. I was particularly struck by the, the video made by Mr. Michael Rugema on behalf of the Rugema family. And so I would like to extend on behalf of UWC and the law faculty in particular, firstly to the Rugema family, a word of appreciation that you are allowing us as UWC to celebrate, commemorate, but also to learn from the life of Ivan Rukema. So his immediate family, Michael and Lillian, his parents, Joshua, Moses, Faith and Michelle, his siblings, we owe you a great deal. To the moderator, Professor Lenahan, to his friends, Claire Akimanzi and Diane Gaiza. It was lovely to see Diane again back at home at UWC. Thank you so much. And then from UWC, Umesh Bawa, Nishlanshla, Modzanana, Vernon Janis, and Sadeen Lowe. At the obituary that I found published in the New Times of Rwanda, a daily newspaper in Rwanda. And I would like to quote, it was stated, the void in our hearts 
will never be fold, but memories we shared will carry us through. Remembered with love by family and friends. This memorial lecture is a token of UWC Faculty of Law remembering and celebrating the life of Ivan Rugema. Having listened carefully to the five participants starting from uh, all five participants who spoke from uh, Ms. Caroline Smart right up to Professor Julia Slot Nielsen, all the remarks they made about Ivan. I had the, the, the feeling in my heart that I wished I'd known him. And I wished I'd come to UWC before Ivan died, not 2015, but in 2014 or earlier. And it was lovely hearing about the kind of person that Ivan was through all of your recollections of his personality. And I have a very clear view in my mind as to the kind of person and the kind of lawyer and the kind of fighter for social justice um, that Ivan was. Thank you, Professor JJ, for allowing us to remember Ivan also through your eyes and mentioning especially the alternative dispute res resolution and the reasons why you would like, would have liked to have, have um, employed that in, in our African context um, in relation to finding peace and security in Africa. And um, thank you for, in a very um, insightful way, elucidating for us all the different phases from pre-colonial um, alternative or uh, um, dispute resolution mechanisms that you explain until the modern one. And I, was, I, I posted the question in the chat or rather the comment that um, I'm, I'm really impressed with your mediation week and already my, my mind has started going as to what UWC can do um, in relation to, to, to this field. And uh, because we have a very slow progress in court and next uh, mediation in South Africa. And just to mention, I felt such an incredible kinship tonight, Prof. Rojeje, um, because I have a personal connection to Rwanda. I serve on the board of Kepler, and you might know them, they're an NGO that and we do accredited bachelor um, and education uh, degrees that we, we have in business communication and healthcare in, in Kigali, and it's for free. And I'm also on the board of the soon to be accredited Kepler College in Kigali, and you won't believe it, but I was due to travel to Kigali in May this year, and then COVID happened. So I'm, I'm telling you, Prof, that if post-COVID, when I have an opportunity to travel uh, to Kigali, I'm going to ask Prof Besmut to connect me with you. Um, thank you very much for your lecture tonight. And um, I also want to say that to the faculty, that I hope that the annual Ivan Rugema Memorial Lecture will in future also focus on peace and security in Africa. We oftentimes focus so much on violence. And um, it is my hope and dream that in some stage at UWC, we will have a center for peace and violence studies so that one also turns the violence into peace. A warm UWC thank you to all of you who participated and have a good evening. I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Lavak. I know why I almost always come to you uh, for uh, these occasions. You contextualize it, you personalize it, uh, and you make it practical. It was a beautiful honor celebrating our friend, colleague, son, sibling, in his own words, a Rwandan, a global citizen, educator, and eternal student who stood on the shoulders of giants so that he can see more than they. And he kept walking. Have a good evening.